So it's really nice to be here and see all, uh, most faces, uh, a lot of people that I already know and you know me and uh, is there anybody that doesn't know who I am? Okay, okay, <laughs> okay. Sapri, okay, so. Um, so sorry for all, all of you that hear this every year, but okay. <laughs> this is, <laughs> it's interesting every year. Every year I have another little detail, right. Um, okay, so my name is Ariela Gretz Bartuv. I'm a reform rabbi. I'm the rabbi of Keilat Emet Veshalom in uh, a reform congregation in Nahariya. Um, and, um, I did not start my life as a reform rabbi. I actually, yes, <laughs> we are, we are, we're, we're, we're working, we're working on it. Here, Judy's working on it, <laughs> right? You're, right, so tell her, tell her not to bother us. <laughs> okay, great, um, okay. So I was, uh, I was born and raised in a, in a home of a conservative rabbi, uh, my father. My mother, uh, Naomi Gretz, maybe some of you studied with her before, an hour ago, right? Um, I would say uh, one of the first feminists in the South that brought uh, the f feminism to Be'er Sheva and uh, to the area. And um, I have a brother that is a conservative rabbi. I, uh, I have, I'm married to an Orthodox guy. And I have a sister that if she has to say what religion she belongs to, she would say Bud Buddhism. <laughs> and uh, uh, so here, my, the sister, my, the, my, the writer, my sister, yeah, my sister, the writer. And um, so with all this balagan, uh, so we left Jerusalem eight years ago to Hanaton, uh, which is, a, you all know, was, is, was a conservative uh, kibbutz, but with a twist. Today it's more of a pluralistic place. People from all kinds of uh, m mixed marriages like mine uh, trying, to <laughs> trying to form a, a, a pluralistic uh, kibbutz, but Four years ago, we moved from Hanaton to Hoshaya. Hoshaya is an Orthodox uh, village in the Galilee. So here's a reform rabbi married to an Orthodox guy living in an Orthodox village. Uh, my life is very interesting, always. And, uh, and I guess this is part of my mission, basically to talk, to be and talk to all kinds of uh, people from all kinds of circles, all kinds of backgrounds and emanations, uh, and to show people that we can, we can live together. It's, it's really, uh, it, it could work, it could work. So basically, when people ask me what, how does it work, a marriage like us, um, so the basically main two things. First of all, a lot of humor and a lot of uh, self-humor and not to take ourselves too seriously. And the second thing is uh, kavod. How do you say kavod? Respect, respect right, respect. <laughs> Mutual respect, exactly. Uh, not that we don't have conflicts, of course we do, because otherwise our life will be uh, boring. And there's no, uh, there's no way to, to be a reform rabbi and to live with an orthodox man and not have conflicts. But uh, uh, as some of my, my uh, congregants that are here know, that uh, we, we do solve, solve things. And uh, this is something I think I never said, but Menos, my husband, says, uh, well, in our family, every couple of years, somebody else suffers a little bit. So now it's my turn to suffer. <laughs> so, uh, okay. So this is me, and thank you all for coming. Today, we're going to talk about uh, Nechama Leibovich, Miriam Peretz. We're going to talk about women that are uh, leaders. 
uh, and basically maybe how they influenced other women to lead and to do some kind of a change in Israeli reality. And I will try also, after we talk about uh, Nechama and uh, Miriam, to talk a little bit about how this meets us in, in, our, uh, in our world, uh, in our millennium world that is changing rapidly and, uh, and I think I would even say the discourse is, uh, is changing. Uh, things that for us are still maybe a, a struggle in our, in our thought or in our mind, even though we really believe that they're, they're the right thing to do, for young people today, uh, they're natural. And um, I'll, I'll just uh, tell you that uh, when, I was, when, when I drove down here this morning, I had a long time to listen to the radio and there was something very interesting that I heard. Uh, we all remember the, the television program, uh, Little House on the Prairie, right? From the 80s. I loved it. I remember as a kid, I watched it. And there's a, some kind of a foundation or something in, in America uh, named after Laura. Okay, I'll just say Laura because her last name is too uh, complicated for me. But uh, I, ju I just heard on the radio that in the United States they decided, oh, and this foundation is a foundation that gives all kinds of prizes uh, for... Uh, uh, for, for people for uh, work in literature and things like that, they, des they decided to stop calling this foundation on her name because the, the books of uh, Little House on the Prairie and the whole figures and were, there were a lot of gizani, uh, 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 racist, there were a lot of racist uh, things in these books, okay? and uh, about Indians and about all kinds of things like that. And it was very interesting to hear the, the two women that talked about it, because one of them said, you know, I read all this literature to my little daughter, Hebrew literature, Leah Goldberg, Dira um, Leaskir. I don't know if you know, but it's, it's a story about a house that all kinds of animals come to, to, rent, to, uh, to rent a room in the house. Right, and there's and there's this animal is not so good because she leaves her ch children alone, and this and there's a a cat that is called Kushit, uh, and okay, and she says, you know, so what does this mean? Are we going to change everything, and we won't read our children these books anymore, and uh, and what they th what they talked about, and I liked that, and I I felt close to what they said that we cannot change history and, and this is part of who we are, this is part of us and what we should do is read these books but maybe talk about these things, okay? Not to take the, uh, the, the mark and, and clean it but to, to put it there and to, to talk about it and say maybe today we don't say things like this, today we think differently and whatever. So, and this, and they also talked about the fact that when Shimon Peres came into the, uh, uh, the president house, when he replaced Katsav, there was this um, statue of Katsav there, and there was a question, should we take out the, the statue or, or leave it there? And in the end, they decided to leave the statue there because they said, this is, he was a president. This is part of, uh, part of our history. And if we take it out, basically we say, this did not happen here. And on the contrary, we should leave him there and we should say, Don't, do, do, do not ever forget that we had a president that is also a rapist, okay? And, uh, and we should never forget that and we should open our eyes and be aware of the fact. So I would say it's, Okay, this is, um, this is, so when I said that the younger generation, when, when they hear these things, they don't fall off the chair because for them it's much, it's much more natural 
the, because it's from their heart already, it's in their soul, that they're less um, uh, maybe chauvinist and, uh, you know, and all the rest. Uh, th this, is, this is in any way my chavaya uh, experience. This is my experience from the younger generation that I meet a lot and all the time. Uh, and uh, it, it's always refreshing and it is, astonishes me. I meet a hundred of Letzari, uh, mainly boys in Haifa that come to do bar mitzvah because I also work in a, in a congregation in Haifa. I cannot uh, be a, a rabbi in a congregation in Aria. It's not enough uh, parnasa. And uh, I worked there already for many years, for about four years, and uh, I met hundreds of uh, bar mitzvah boys, and it's amazing. They all, almost all of them, come to the reform congregation to do their bar mitzvah because they want their mother to be next to them, and they want the, uh, the, the ceremony that the family is together. And it's something that is, they're 13 year old, okay? They don't have too many uh, ideologies and whatever. Uh, maybe their mother are feminists, but okay, 13 year old kids, it's something that it's built in, in them. And it's against all odds because most of their friends don't go, don't do a bar mitzvah in a reform shul yet, still. Well, that's, that's another question because their sisters do not want it, even though their parents tell them, okay? So it's, it's a problem. We're not gonna open it now, but it's, it, it's an issue. It's an issue and it's, a, it's, it's not easy. It's not easy and it's still not mekubal in Israel. Uh, and we're working on it. Okay, so this was a long introduction. to read all everything here even though it was very hard for me to decide what to give up so I just decided not to and uh, I, uh, I just I brought a long a long material sheet uh, take it it's your gift for Shabbat <laughs> you can uh, you can uh, read it uh, you can read it through Shabbat whatever we we do not uh, we do not uh, do here. Um, also, I'm reminding you that th it's, uh, this is not a lecture. You can add things, ask, say, okay? And um, so wait, Susan, can you, can you come here to, to read maybe? <laughs> Poor Susan. <laughs> Susan, how, how do you still come to my classes every year? Oh, <laughs> Oy, poor you. I got you here to read. Okay, so we're, we're going to start reading uh, about Nechama Leibovitch uh, by Yael Unterman. Yael Unterman wrote a biography on, uh, on uh, Nechama. And, uh, okay, so. Okay. Okay, you see well. Uh, yeah, I can see. Okay. Ken, yes, old. יש עוד דפים? Everybody has a דף? אוקיי. נחמה ליבוביץ' was born in 1905 in Riga, Latvia, to Mordechai and Freda Leibovitch. She grew up in a home filled with Jewish and general culture, competing in her father's Bible quizzes against her brother Yeshayahu, who later became a famous and controversial <coughs> Israeli philosopher. In 1919, the family moved to Berlin, where Leibovitch taught, wrote articles, and studied for her doctorate. She married her uncle, Lippmann Leibovitch, who was many years her senior, and on the day she finished her doctorate, 
they fulfilled their dream and moved to Israel. Leibovitch's combination of personality traits, a keen mind, warmth, humor, dramatic flair, and insight, as well as the breadth of knowledge she had acquired at home and at university, made her an excellent teacher. And she even began training other teachers while still in her 20s, eventually publishing several works of pedagogical insights into Bible teaching. She traveled around the country on buses, in taxis, and on airplanes, teaching Bible and comment commentaries to teachers, new immigrants, soldiers, kibbutzniks, and thousands of ordinary people. She, she received a professorship at Tel Aviv University in 1968 <coughs> and was awarded several prizes in the course of her life, including the prestigious Israel Prize in the field of education in 1956. In 1942, some of Leibovitch's students decided they wanted to continue studying her material even after the school year had ended. Acceding to their request, Leibovitch began mailing them her worksheets, which contained commentaries unavailable at the time, and furthermore, challenged them with difficult questions, with every answer checked personally by Leibovitch. Words spread to friends and neighbors who also wanted to fill out these sheets. Eventually, the correspondence ran into the thousands, young and old, religious and secular, kibbutznik and city dwellers. Thus, Leibovitch functioned as a one-woman open university correspondence course for over 30 years without ever receiving remuneration. I didn't, I didn't know that. Yeah, I, it's, uh, it's very interesting. Yeah. Are you okay with the reader? Yeah, yeah. Really great. Okay. Through her teaching, <coughs> her worksheets, and her famous Unim studies Unim. of books on the weekly portion, appearing in six languages on bookshelves from Jerusalem to Guatemala, Leibovitch brought numerous people, including non-Jews, to a new conception of Torah study. She salvaged the classic commentaries on Bible from the musty attic to which they had been relegated by both the yeshiva world which focused most, almost exclusively on Talmud, and the secular world, whose interest lay in biblical criticism, archaeology, and history. She, and her students after her, revolutionized the world of Torah study. And today, Leibovitch's question, what's Rashi's difficulty, is commonplace, as is her method encouraging comparison and evaluation of commentaries. This latter method introduced a certain level of pluralism into the study of Torah. Many voices of interpretation were allowed, including even certain non-Orthodox scholars, who Leibovitch insisted were very valuable despite the criticism she received, and they were subjected to a rigorous analysis evaluated for their faithfulness to the text. However, Leibovitch, always the educator, did not make do with comparing and contrasting. She almost inevitably liked to emphasize a moral message deriving from the study. Thus, she writes, if we accept that the midwives were Egyptian, a very vital message becomes apparent. The Torah indicates how the individual can resist evil. He need not shirk his moral responsibilities under cover of superior orders. The, next, the text contrasts the brutal decrees of enslavement and massacre initiated by Pharaoh and supported by government and people with God-fearing civil disobedience of the midwives. Neither the moral courage nor sheer wickedness, neither moral courage nor sheer wickedness are ethnically or nationally determined qualities. Moab and Ammon produced a Ruth and a Nama, respectively, Egypt to righteous midwives. This message, upholding the lesson accepted reading of this passage, i.e., that the midwives were Egyptian, derived from Leibovitch's own outlook and emphases, and was not one that others would necessarily have promoted. It is also clearly inspired by her 20th century context, echoing the evasion and of responsibility of those who cited superior orders during the Holocaust, something she explicitly addresses elsewhere. 
She indeed believed that all of the messages can and must be relevant to modern life, as she says, paraphrasing Maimonides. The lack of thought, the lack of thought content, the, the dearth of a religious, religious message must be traced to the incapacity of the student in failing to detect the eternal inner significance underlying the apparent dryly technical historical details. If it seems a vain thing, it is your fault. Loathing as she did the approach of biblical criticism, Leibovitch turned to the newly developed, developing literary approach as a method within academia that would be consistent with her beliefs. She rejected the archeological, geographical, and historical dimensions of the text as irrelevant to its true message. According to her, a shepherd was far less likely to contribute insight to Psalm 23 than would be a person on his or her deathbed. Okay, In wait, I just, I wanna, okay. uh, I wanna say that um, this, is, it's, it's, this is important because Nechama Leibovitch would always say about herself that she's not a commentator of the Torah. She's just a teacher, okay? And, um, and it, there's, it's, it's, not, it's not clear why, why she said that, uh, but on the other hand, it is clear because she, basically what she's trying to say is I'm not saying new things okay, about the Torah. I'm just helping people to find relevancy to their life, to, uh, to the modern life. I'm just looking at Rashi and all the other commentators and trying to see what bothered them or what they saw, what kind of insights they had. Um, but obviously, what, what Yael Unterman is writing here, right, about Nechama's insights about the text, it's very hard to look at this and say, she's not a commentator. So for us, I think we see these two sides in, in Nechama, okay? Her, her saying about herself that she's not a commentator, but we looking at her work and her insights and saying, yes, she is, of course she is. So I'm, I'm saying this, I'm mentioning this because many times uh, people that are leaders maybe don't even realize or don't even know it. And, uh, and I would even say that maybe it's even more so for, for a woman, that basically uh, she, she was poretz derech. Uh, Trailblazer. Tra Trailblazer. Trailblazer? Okay, trailblazer. And, uh, and maybe, you know, maybe she, she didn't come from that place and she, maybe she didn't think about herself like that. Uh, she was also too modest. And, uh, but, but this is one thing that I want you to, to have in mind, to think about. Uh, okay, let's see where are we going to continue now. Um, I would say from Leibowitz's hum, uh, humility. Uh, yeah. Okay, Leibovitch humility. Yeah. Okay. You're okay? Sorry? Yeah, sure. Okay. Just tell me when to stop. Okay. So, Leibovitch, Leibovitch's humility was legend. She insisted that everyone call her Nechama and refused to let newspapers interview her or to allow people to come simply in order to meet her, declaring, I am not a museum. Her simplicity of lifestyle was striking, too. People entering her apartment were often struck speechless at how little physical comfort she allowed herself. Famously, she gave a beggar a brand new suit she had bought herself. When challenged as to why, she retorted, should I give him old and worn clothes? <laughs> Leibovitch uh, loved simple people and her poignant stories about taxi drivers and their wisdom are often quoted by her students. A passionate Zionist, Leibovitch refused to leave Israel, even when offered large sums of money to lecture abroad. She believed that Torah must be taught in Hebrew and that Hebrew should also be the language spoken by all Jews. She was a deeply religious person, but of the sort that emphasized halakha and Torah study, moral responsibility, ethics, and humanistic focus, 
rather than ecstatic and mystical dimensions, which she feared might prove shallow or transient. Thus, she had little to do with Hasidim or Kabbalah. She disapproved of superstition, contesting the practice of investing holiness in Jewish saints and praying to them, and at the same time, believed that the heroes of the Bible, whom she respected and loved tremendously, were also not to be overly exalted. The Torah itself marks their flaws, and so can and should we. Leibovitch also opposed the ideas of feminism and the feminist movement. Several feminists who were close to her, such as Blue Greenberg and Hannah Safrai, attempted to persuade her to change her mind, but without success. While she upheld equal pay and rights for women, Leibovitch did not consciously desire to change the balance of designated gender roles within traditional society. The fact that she herself had been brought up in a completely intellectual equality with her brother was probably a primary source of her self-confidence and powerful teaching to the point of reducing some of many distinguished rabbis in her class to anxious schoolboys. But she never referred to her good fortune in this respect or to the effect its absence might have had in other homes. While she believed women should study Torah, she refused to countenance attempts to remove women from her Torah classes. And while she even referred to the Talmud from time to time, certainly an unusual phenomenon for a woman in the earlier years of her career, Leibovitch rejected the drive for women to take on more commandments, such as communal roles or laying of tefillin, as representing not the result of authentic religious emotion, but rather ideas promulgated by the secular feminist movement. Torah study con constitutes gratification for women, and to take away this intellectual enjoyment and activity is an injustice. When it want, what, but when it comes to keeping mitzvot, you just have to do what God says, she explained. Leibovitch refused to acknowledge that she was a revolutionary in any way, but ultimately her unique achievements changed Orthodox society's perception of a woman's capabilities and undoubtedly opened doors for the female Torah scholars who followed. This, it, this itself is proof of the power of gradual evolutionary change. It is this duality of self-definition and deeds that leads to the fact that Leibovitch may be claimed by all camps as their own. She is held up as a beacon of modesty and learning by conservative elements, whilst feminists point to her impact and consider her an important milestone in Jewish women's empowerment. All her achievements notwithstanding, the childless Leibovitch confi confided that she would have given it all up to have children. But at her funeral in 1997, her nephew announced, all those who feel as I do, like a son to Nechama, may join in the Kaddish prayer with me. And suddenly, from all quarters, thousands of voices rose in unison to say, Yitkadal v'yitkadash Rabah. In accordance with her request on her gravestone, was written only Nechama Leibovitch, teacher. And to this day, she is still teaching new generations Torah through her books and through her books, her methods, and her students, many of whom are prominent teachers and rabbis in the Jewish world. Her impact has been primarily within modern orthodoxy, but many non-orthodox and secular people have also been exposed to her work and even some ultra-Orthodox elements recognize her greatness. One such yeshiva student, embarrassed to be heard quoting a woman, changed her name slightly when repeating her Torah, and thus unbeknownst to her, Nechama was summarily transformed into Reb Nachman. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so thank you, Susan. Um, so I think this is, uh, this is really interesting, okay, to, to see uh, when, it, when it comes, you know, to where we're talking about feminism and uh, a woman that is, a, is basically a leader and even doing some kind of a revolution. 
uh, with Torah study, and uh, she 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 did not come from from that place. Okay, she did not come from from there. Uh, and Yael writes here that maybe you know she was fortunate enough to come from a home that she was treated equally from from the minute uh, she was born. Apparently, uh, I would. I also want to mention that it's very interesting because I'll also mention this about Miriam Peretz soon, and this is something that I see that that relates to both of them. That Nechama basically comes from. Uh, from a wild, from a, uh, not wild, Rachav, um, oh, wide. wide, wide world, okay? She comes from a wide world. She, she lived in Europe, she lived in Berlin, she studied in the university, she studied Bikorat uh, Amikra, a criticism of, uh, of the Torah, of the Bible, and um, she, she comes from, from, a, from a place uh, of different, also different thinking. It's not, she comes from, not from a narrow uh, thinking, not just from one way. And uh, I'll tell you a little story because we're not going to read. Um, uh, I, I brought here a Dr. Rachel Edelman. Uh, she wrote a commentary, a, a review on Yael Unterman's book. And um, this was in Jer Jerusalem Post in 2009, and um, we're not going to read the whole thing now, but um, she, she tells, I think this is here, I'm not sure, but I'll tell you the story. She, she tells the story that um, when Nechama was a little girl, uh, this appears in Yael Unterman's book, she woke up late one morning. She was a very prompt girl. She went to school on time every day, and one morning, Mala thought she woke up late and she was very uh, worried because of that and she did everything fast and she ran out of the house quickly without davening, without praying. And uh, while she ran out of the house, she fell down and she got bruised, you know, and she was crying and she came home and she, she said to her father, uh, you see what happened to me because I did not pray? I fell down, and her father looks at her and he says to her, Nechama, you think that you're an angel? God, res God responds immediately just to, to angels, and uh, you think that God will, will punish you because you, you forgot to pray? Uh, so her father, like, you know, tells her, you know, Right, no big deal, but more than that, okay? God doesn't give you immediately, he doesn't strike you immediately. This is not, this is not a true thing, okay? Right, but he, he said it nicely. He said, you know, you're not an angel. He only responds to angels uh, immediately. So uh, why, why, why is the story important? Because it's also a way of thinking uh, that is also different. You have a woman here that is very orthodox. She's very religious. Uh, she, uh, she, she does not want to change when it comes to halacha, okay? But she does talk about the intellect. She does talk about women. She says every, every woman should enjoy her, her brain, her mind, okay? Why should we take away the, the enjoyment of, uh, of studying Torah. I don't know if you were here before when, with the rabbis here, with the panel. It was nice to see, you know, the, the Orthodox uh, rabbi and the Reform rabbi both speaking with their face shining about studying Talmud. So I think that basically she, she comes from, from where she comes from, from, from her home, from her personality, from from being a very simple person and, uh, and, and bringing her love and passion to, to, to studying Torah. Basically, she went with, it's, it's called the why question, okay? Why, why, do we do some, why do we do something in our life? What's our goal? What's our, okay? What's the meaning? What's the meaning of our, of our actions, of what we do? 
it could, we could ask ourselves this question in everything we do, including making sandwiches for your children every morning uh, to wake up early and to make all the food in the sandwich that they'll have it uh, when, they, when they go to school. And even, even for that, there's, there's a meaning. You have to look for it, you have to ask yourself this question, you have to be there. So I think that uh, Nechama basically just went with her, she went with her passion, she went with, uh, with what she believed in, and, uh, and that's the way she, she, st she taught Torah. That's the way she brought a big, big message to the world. Um, maybe she doesn't agree that she, she is part of the feminist activities that were, that were in Israel, that are still in Israel. She might say, no, I'm not a feminist, but it's out of her hands. <laughs> Okay, and it was already out of her hands, and I think that that's what happens when you know when you're uh, when you're a person like that that you you teach other people and you make a change in people's life, you make a change in in the world. So you you cannot control it anymore. Yeah. Well, it's very interesting because she, uh, one of her teachers was uh, Leo Beck, ah, okay, okay. Uh, and uh, uh, Regina, Regina right, Regina, um, and uh, she did, she did meet a another, another person that was her, uh, a, I don't know if her teacher or, or, or even Chavruta or something was Meir Wise. Yes, right, Mayor Wise, that was also from, uh, from the, f the first people that started basically their, re their reform. Uh, it's not a movement yet, but okay, the reform. Yeah. And so basically she knew, she knew people, she studied with, uh, with these big thinkers and, uh, um, and, and, uh, and she also knew other, uh, other religions, okay, she, she came from a very uh, muskil, a very educated, very educated and learned and, and university and et cetera. Yeah. I just wanted to say, I had her privilege of studying with her. We made Aliyah in June of 1973, and she came every week to the Merkaz Vita and gave two lessons, one in easy Hebrew and one in more involved Hebrew. And when the war broke out, she continued to come, and I remember the room with all the blinds closed, and she taught us. Wow, where was this? Mivaseret. Wow, that's that's a great story. Very great story. In the in the Hebrew class before, somebody told us the, this story that she she studied in the university. She studied uh, Tanakh. And there was this very, very big room uh, with it was. She said it was packed with people, and uh, and she sat there, you know, on the second or third row, and uh, everybody's listening to Nechama, and eh? and suddenly Nechama goes down from uh, from where she was standing, okay, and she goes, she comes down, and she comes over to her. She was sitting, and she says quietly in her in her ear, uh, please take out the gum from your mouth. <laughs> so she said, she's never going to. She said she's never going to get to forget this. Uh, this. Yeah, but you know, she went quietly, besheket over to her and told her, you know, nobody else heard. And uh, <laughs> good story. Right. Right. Great story. Um, so okay, so so we have uh, we have a, a woman here, okay, that uh, that is, I'm sure you all agree, that is a leader, okay, 
a leader and uh, I would even say a revolutionary uh, leader in a way, but very in a very um, quiet way, uh, in a very amami. Um, amami is like the... <laughs> It's am um, am is you know right down to earth down to earth and with through through the people and uh, and and as we see she held this this whole thing for many many years giving writing answers to people nobody helped her okay and it was it's it really I think it's really incredible uh, no wonder that she got the Israel uh, Prize. Uh, and I would like to. Right. Ah, right, right. Her son is married to the granddaughter of. Right. That's true. Right. Right. Ishaya Ulebovich. Right. They both both answered all the letters, and and it's nice to see when sometimes it took him a, a few weeks to answer somebody, and he apologizes. He writes and he apologizes to the person, and he says to him, "I'm sorry that it." Right. That's that's how I know, because right, because and I I also have. Uh, um, Right, Ofran is uh, they're, they're good friends of ours. Also, their grandchildren. It's very interesting to see the grandchildren, which are also uh, very. They're all, they're all Zionists. They're all in. Uh, they're all scholars, and uh, they, they, they're in Israel. They take, they, they take after their uh, aunt and and uh, grandfather. It's very, it's very interesting to see this. Um, so I would uh, I would like us to uh, now to talk about Miriam Peretz because I don't know how much oh this is good we have a clock a clock here I think in every room we should have a clock so is this correct it's uh, oh okay okay so it's two o'clock now until when do we have two twenty five. Okay, so we have to uh, run. Um, so, Miriam Peretz, um, nobody wrote a, a, a biography about her yet, and it's, uh, right, and it was hard, not easy to find uh, uh, scholarly things uh, about Miriam, but I did bring some uh, things from, you know, Jerusalem Post and... Um, um, I, I met Miriam Peretz uh, a few years ago in my, uh, in my, my oldest uh, son uh, when he was in high school in a yeshiva in Tveria. Uh, they, they brought Miriam as a, as a hero for, they had a Hanukkah a Lapid a marching, uh, you know, with lights and, a, a, and every, it would talk, talk Tortures. I know it sounds like tort, right? Okay, right. We're not torturing anybody, chas v'chalila, right? And um, uh, every year they they uh, dedicated to somebody else, and uh, they brought Miriam Peretz as their hero for that year. And uh, I I was there with my uh, youngest daughter. She I think she was in third grade then. And uh, I have to tell you this because it was amazing. Miriam talked for an hour and a half, and Merav, my daughter, did not move. She, it's not, not that she fell asleep. She <laughs> sat there, and she did not move for an hour and a half. She was listening to Miriam. There's something uh, about her that is, yeah, she's full of life, right, and it's electricity. Um, one of the things that uh, that 
that struck me, she was talking about what does it mean to be a hero? To be a hero is to make meatballs, okay? Why? Because she said that her uh, neched, her grandson, that his father died, Eliraz, came to her and asked her to, to make the, the, these specific meatballs that her son loved. And she said, you know how much courage I needed, how much koach nafshi, how much... Inner? Inner strength. How much inner strength I needed to, to pull out from myself to actually make these, uh, these, these meatballs for my grandchildren. And she said, for me, that's to be a hero. And, uh, and it's, I think it's, it's something that we, we all can, can understand because we'll, we'll, we'll read a little bit uh, about Miriam and you'll see she says all kinds of things like this. It's really uh, amazing. So uh, wait, I want to... What, let's see what I brought here. Rega. Uh, did you all read, read or hear her, um, her ceremony, her speech? Okay. So, um, so we won't read that. Um, okay. Let's let's jump. Okay, well, no, let's, we'll, we'll jump, but we'll start, okay, by Tamar Ziv, uh, May 4, 2014. Um, okay, who am I? Do you see uh, in, the, in, the, in the bottom? Okay, who am I? Was the first thought that ran through Miriam Peretz's mind when she was asked to do the honor of lighting a torch for Independence Day. What am I, she stresses. I'm a simple person. They wouldn't have heard of me if it wasn't for my sons, she explains. Referring to fallen Golani brigade soldiers Uriel and Eliraz, the former uh, who was killed in Lebanon in 1998 at the age of 22, and the later who was slain in Gaza in 2010 at age 31. She says that while each of the 14 women selected for the ceremony represents something, women, 14 people, represents something different, she did not choose to represent anyone. Reality brought me to this situation, she tells the Jerusalem Post. But she did choose to pick her, her, herself up out of the pain and a bereavement and to build to build from it a tower of love love of Israel and the human uh, strength to influence your own and other people's lives when Peretz received the phone call about the ceremony she was at a Navy course uh, as part of her daily Hasbara work in which she meets with soldiers youth and bereaved families and delivers uh, motivational speeches. Um, okay, wait, I want to I wanna jump. Okay, go to... Uh, I wanted to tell you a little bit about where she came from. I don't know if I have this here, so I'll just say... The last sentence. The last Okay. Right. Okay, uh, Peretz, whose family made Aliyah from Morocco when she was a little girl, says she has experienced the price of both war and peace. Uh, her family was evacuated from Sharm el-Sheikh in Sinai when the peace treaty was signed between Israel and Egypt in 1979. Her wish for the coming years in that there will be solidarity between Israelis regardless of their various opinions. We must remember that we're brothers. Further than this, she prays every day for peace, that parents will not bury their children in this land, that we will see our kids building their homes, learning and growing. Okay, so, um, I, I don't know if, it, oh, this she also tells in her, in her speech, she says that 
when she was a 10-year-old girl in Morocco, one day her father told her that uh, uh, tomorrow the Mashiach is coming and uh, we're going to go to Israel. And she says to him, so how will I know? How do I know? How does the Mashiach look? And he says, the Mashiach will come with, with a short sleeve shirt, with shorts and sandals and a hat, kova tembel. Uh, so we know that we're, we're talking about the Shaliach from the Sochnut or... Right, and uh, there were the Meshichim, and that's how they came to Israel. So, um, so I brought a, uh, a, an amazing, wait, wait just a minute, an amazing interview um, that a man by the name of Gabriel Grossman, he's the mayor of Bell Harbor, Florida Synagogue. Uh, and um, he basically came to interview her. I did not bring the whole interview, but you can look look for it in the uh, uh, in the media. Um, and he says to her, "How do you describe what you do?" I ask. Gabriel asks. It's a new mission that God gave me. She says, "I begin to do it. I began to do it after Uriel was killed." I met with soldiers. I speak to them about leadership and about the values of my sons. I never speak to them only about death and darkness. I want to give them hope. I tell them that to hold on to life. Life is very, very important for us. But what kind of life? I can spend my life building a new house, etc., etc. But I understand after the death of my two children and my husband that God gives me every day time to live. What do I want to do with these moments? To waste them or to do something with meaning? When I meet these people, I don't understand how they say they take from the meeting strength to continue. I get maybe 5,000 letters from people from Israel and around the world that say how I influence them. And I ask myself, me, me? At the end of the day, what do I do? All I do is tell the story of Israel, but I tell the story about life. I prefer to speak about life, not death. When they see me, they understand that they can continue. I get strength from these meetings. Even after the meeting, I feel empty, like all of my heart came out. But then I meet soldiers who tell me that they became an officer because of my story. I meet bereaved mothers and they ask me to come to visit them to give them strength. I say, I'm like you, how can I give you strength? They answer, when we see you, we know that we can continue. We see life. After Operation, Protec After Operation Protective Edge, I met with 50 families who lost children in the war. They called me to come and it's not easy for me. It brings me back to my story. When I come to their houses, I remember how people came to my house also. It's not easy, but when I see the children and the parents take a little hope, I'm very happy. The first time she spoke publicly was to a group of officer candidates on Mount Gilo in Jerusalem in 1999, one year after Uriel's death. Did they call you to ask you to speak? One minute. My son Eliraz was in this group. He called me and said, they invited a speaker and that speaker canceled. It was the day before Memorial Day. Can, so Eliraz asked Miriam, his mother, can you come to speak with these soldiers? And I said, Eliraz, I don't know how to speak with soldiers. What, would I, what will I speak to them about? He said, mom, you have a notebook that Uriel's soldiers wrote for, he, for you after Uriel died. Please take the notebook, read something, and say something. You are a principal of a school. <laughs> you know how to speak. So I opened this notebook. She stands up and walks over to her bookcase and shares an incredible book with me. She explains that she gave the soldiers the notebook and asked them to write memories about her son Uriel their commander. A few days later, 
she says, they returned, they returned a notebook full of letters to her about her son. So I, I want to say that, first of all, Miriam Peretz uh, is, is, was an educator. She, she's a, she was a teacher. She's a principal of a school. At age 24, I think, she was offered already to be a principal of a school. Okay? She's, she's a, a leader. She's a natural leader. Uh, she's, a, she's, a, she's a Zionist. She's, she's a dynamo. She was always like this. And the, uh, the death of her sons and, and later, and also her husband, basically uh, made her decide what new meaning she's going to look for and find in, in her life and for other people as, as a messenger. Um, I, I brought these, uh, these two women because I think there's something uh, in their leadership, and you know that uh, Miriam is also connected to the school that she was a principal of for many years, and Givad Ze'ev was a Tali school. And um, basically she's part of the Tali team, and um, uh, two, uh, two years ago there was a big, big event, 40 years for, for Tali, uh, and she was there, and she spoke, and, she, and Naftali Bennett was also there. Um, and she spoke, and it was uh, it was incredible also to hear her. Um, I brought in the back of your, uh, the the last thing. I brought something very interesting that is called it's a book, the Athena Doctrine: How women and the men who think like them will rule the future. Um, there is this man, John Ger Gerz Gerzema, and Michael. Antonio, uh, that wrote, first of all, Athena was uh, a Greek, uh, Ela, right, that, uh, that believed in, in winning, okay, uh, in war or conflicts in general, not by force, but by brain, okay, with your, with your brain, with your logic. And, uh, and that's why basically they named their book after her. Uh, the Athena doctrine, Athena doctrine. They basically will do this really short, right? We we have what five minutes or something, yeah. uh, something like that. Okay, okay. They five minutes. Okay. They uh, they had this uh, serv They surveyed sixty four thousand people. Okay, over thirteen nations, and um, they realized that. Two thirds feel the world would be a better place if men thought more like women, and this marks a um, burgeoning, burgeoning global trend away from the uh, winner takes it all, okay, masculine approach, and uh, and basically what what they saw is, and also I recommend you also to look for for this, okay. There's a PDF. Uh, I, I brought it here, but there's a PDF uh, uh, in the internet that basically brings all kinds of trunots, uh, the trades. Traits. Traits, okay. They bring traits of uh, a, that people said, what is a woman what are feminine and what are male traits, and what are uh, equal for both, and uh, and it's very easy, it's very amazing to see. Okay, and they basically approached young people, and the the old patterns, let's say, okay, of how women think or how men think or what society thinks about what what is more feminine and what is more uh, male is still exists. Uh, even in the minds of the young millennium uh, people. Uh, but what's interesting is that more and more businesses and more and more places are trying to take the uh, feminine traits and rule and lead by them. And it's interesting to see that young men that understand this or understood this and 
they, they are today the ones who are l leaders and um, directors and whatever in all kinds of places. Uh, and I don't know what it means, okay? It, maybe it means that young men that will understand that this is where the world is going to will still have a itaron advantage on and the, and young women, I don't know, but maybe also things will 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 change and it won't matter anymore so much. Okay, uh, but it's it is very interesting to see that the world is uh, is changing, and not just in thought but in in action. So um, I think we brought some uh, examples of women who did it. Uh, in in a f in a very feminine way, and uh, hopefully we will continue uh, with this uh, megama uh, of this of the world. So thank you very much, and Shabbat Shalom.